Well, this morning we're going to continue on in our series of uh, the four cups, and uh, I've, I've been really, um, you, you, there's, there's some sermons I enjoy listening to more than others. I, I listen to myself talk, um, but these, these last two I really have found uh, very encouraging as we talked about the, the first two cups, the, cups of, the cup of salvation and the cup of uh, deliverance, and this morning we're going to ca- talk about the cup of redemption. And redemption sounds like a big word, sounds like something deeply theological, but really, here's, what we, we, here's how we define uh, redemption or to redeem. Redeem, it simply means to buy back uh, something or to cash in the value of something in order to receive something else. It, so redeem just equals buy back. When we talk about redeeming, we, we talk about buying back. And the best analogy I could come up with for this is uh, any parent that has ever been to Chuck E. Cheese <laughs> understands this, uh, deeply understands this. I don't know if you've gone to Chuck E. Cheese recently. Uh, it's an experience that if you can uh, avoid, you should. Um, <laughs> but at, at, at Chuck E. Cheese, every game spits out tickets. Spits out tickets, right? And so here's the interesting thing. They, 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 they did something I had never seen them do, this Chuck E. Cheese and, and brick here. They told you how much a ticket's worth. It's worth one penny. It's, I would rather just, I'll, I will give you 500 pennies rather than stand here and feed these little things into this. And then you go and get, have, have you, you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you go there and you get these little, they, they, they spend 20 minutes standing there going, okay, I've got 250 tickets. I'll take six pieces of Laffy Taffy and a toy that will break before I get to the car. This is exactly the process. I'm like, just let me give you $5. Can I just give you $5? We skipped the whole experience. Uh, but hey, they, they, who doesn't enjoy watching an animatronic mouse sing, right? Right? Are you with me? Right. And so uh, redeeming, when we redeem, it's, it's, it's literally just buying back something. You are, you are exchanging something. And so when God redeemed us, let's thank Jesus that he didn't have to stand at the ticket counter. And say, I'll take that one for 250 tickets, because I'm not sure how many tickets I'm worth. Um, But God, what he did, when he redeemed us, he he paid our debt of sin. He literally, and what did he exchange for us? He exchanged himself. He redeemed redeemed us with his own life. Uh, And so the debt of sin, through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, uh, in return, we can experience the freedom the freedom that he gave us. You know, redemption, very simply, it means that God has enabled us to live the life we're supposed to live by buying us back. You know, the cup of salvation, the very first one that we talked about, um, that was the freedom from sin, where he bought us out of slavery to sin. And if you haven't listened to that message, you can find it on our website. You can go back through Facebook and find it on our Facebook Lives as well. But you can go to uh, calvarylighthouse.org and find any past sermons there. Uh, But the cup of salvation is where we are freed from sin. But last week we talked about the cup of deliverance. And the cup of deliverance is the process by which we find freedom and victory because our salvation is instantaneous. We are instantly saved by God's grace. But the deliverance that we need, the, the, the strength to overcome sin, is oftentimes a process in our lives because we need to be delivered. Just as the, people, the children of Israel, they were immediately released as slaves when Jesus said, when God said that he would free them, but they still fought like a slave. They still acted like a slave, and we can do that same thing. Um, Israel was freed from making mud bricks. And God restored them to his plan for them so that they could fulfill their lives that he had called them to. Because God had a glorious plan for Israel, didn't he? And it was not for them to live as slaves. His plan involved them occupying the promised land as his chosen people. I gotta tell you, those promises of God We have them for ourselves today. God doesn't want you to live as a slave. He doesn't want you to live in bondage to sin. He wants you to drink from all four cups. He wants you to drink from salvation and deliverance and redemption. So 
part of understanding this is understanding the promises that God has given us through his son and through his word. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today as we talk about the cup of redemption. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer as we, uh, we ask God to bless us this morning? Jesus, this morning I ask that you would be with us. Lead us, guide us, direct us, speak to our hearts so that we can hear your voice. Let us be sensitive to what you're saying. Let us understand your Holy Spirit. Guide us today in your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. When people are bound up in slavery to sin, and when they have not yet drank from the cup of redemption, I'm sorry, drank from the cup of salvation or the cup of deliverance, they cannot fulfill the purpose that God has for them. That's why I love that video, um, that video of uh, the mission the mission stories, because several of the folks that participate in that they will tell you that they identified their purpose as they went and served in missions. I got to tell you this morning. God has a purpose for you. God has a purpose for you. It's not just to come sit in a pew. It's not just to go to your job, although your job's important. God has a purpose beyond just what we do in life. God has a plan for us. In Ephesians chapter 2, it tells us that God prepared for them in advance, meaning that he knew you were going to come to him. But when we're bound up, when we have not drank from the cup of salvation, we haven't experienced the process of deliverance, we can't fully fulfill the call of who God has, desires for us to be and the purpose of why we are on this earth. And so let's review just a little bit about the promises of God that he, he shared with us. Um, in Exodus chapter 6, Verse 6, here's what it says. It says, therefore, say to Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. In the first cup, I will free you from being slaves to them. That's the cup of salvation. I will free you from being slaves to them. And then the second cup is that next verse. It says, I will free, I will redeem you. I'm sorry, I will free you being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with outstretched arm and with mighty acts. It says, he'll bring us out from the yokes of the Egyptian, that's salvation. I will free you from being slaves to them, that's the cup of deliverance. And then the third one he has, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And then verse 7, it continues on, it says, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And so the, the, the four cups that he has for us, it's the cup of salvation. You know the cup of salvation, in case you, you haven't picked it up yet, the cup of salvation is Jesus. He gave us Jesus so that we could be free from sin. He gave us the cup of deliverance so that we could be free from those entanglements and the bondages that hold us back. He gave us the cup of redemption so that he could restore us to the purpose and plan that he has for us in this world. And then next week we'll talk about the cup of praise, which is the fulfillment of his promises in our lives. And i got to tell you, I'm, I'm really excited about this because when people understand, when we start to grasp that God has more for us, we should get excited. When you start to hold on to the fact that what you're experiencing in life right now is not all there is, God has more for you. That should excite you. Because maybe you're having a hard time. Maybe uh, like the Perez's, you, you've been go you were going through a season of hell, and you're like, I, I need something more. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're in where you feel like you're in your sweet spot, and things are going great. God has more for you. Whether you're on a high or a low, God has more for you. You haven't found the fullness of what he has for you. You haven't experienced the fullness of who he called you to be. He has more for you. And that is what begins with a cup of redemption. But here's the question that we always left with. Why do so few people drink from this cup? I can tell you from years of experience in ministry that there's a lot of people that they never experience the fullness of what God has for them. They don't. They don't grab a hold of that plan. 
They don't call it, grab a hold of that dream. They live in fear. And I think one of the reasons that people live there, why they don't drink from it, is that they've got an inferiority complex. It's really a lie that the devil's given you. The devil's going to lie to you. He's going to lie to you. And as we talked about last week, um, he's, he's trying to eat anyone that he can. Because the devil has a plan for your life. The devil has a plan for your life. And he'll do anything he can to obscure your identity in Jesus. He will do anything he can to convince you that you are not worthy of the more that God has for you. He will do anything he can to convince you that you are so lowly and unworthy that you don't deserve to fulfill the full purpose of what God's called you for. Well, here's the beautiful thing to understand. He's right in one thing. On my own, I am not worthy. But when I drink from the cup of salvation, Jesus makes us worthy. He frees us from that slavery. But sometimes when we haven't walked through the cup of deliverance, when we haven't walked through, we still get that stinking thinking that holds us back that says, I'm not worthy, I'm scum. You don't know what I used to do. Pastor Spencer, you don't know the person I used to be. And you're right, I don't know the person you used to be, and I don't care about the person you used to be. I care about the person that God has called you to be. Because he's called you for more. The devil's going to undermine your efforts and try and keep you from finding God's best for your life. And he will put anything in your path that he can to slow you down. Maybe it's people from high school that they remember how you used to be. Maybe it's a, I, I, got, I got family that watches this periodically, so, but she doesn't watch it. So I got an aunt. She always made me feel like I was less than, right? She always made me feel, and you, maybe you got that somebody in your life, right? They always make you feel like you're less than. They remember you when you were that little kid, right? That's why Jesus said, you know, a prophet, a prophet has no honor in his own hometown, I'll never forget when I was a children's pastor at my home church, and uh, I, was, I was talking to one of my volunteers, and they were getting, they were getting a little squirrely with me, and they, they said, I don't really have to listen to you. I said, well, actually, I'm kind of the children's pastor, and their response was, hey, don't forget, I changed your diapers. It's hard to argue with that, right? <laughs> yep, you won up on me. I've never changed your diaper. That's, that's good. I've wiped your nose a little bit because you're kind of snotty, but here's the thing. Do you have that person in your life that wants to tell you who you used to be all the time? Not everyone's ready to let you grow up. Not everyone's let, willing to let you change. And you might be an entirely different person than you were five years ago. But if that person hasn't been with you, all they remember is the old you. And the old you might have been bad. Like the kids I used to run around with as teenagers, all they know about me really, uh, you know, we used to go toilet papering a lot. How many, just admit this, okay, a little survey. How many of you have toilet papered somebody's house? Really? Is that not a big thing out here? Oh, thank you, Pat. Pat Lloyd stands up and raises her hand. Yes, I have. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now, I will tell you, as, as a teenager, we toilet papered many, many houses. Many, many houses. But the one house that we were never willing to toilet paper was that of my senior pastor. And so I say that's a tradition we should continue on. Uh, never toilet papering senior pastor's house. Because um, God has a plan for your life, and uh, if you toilet paper in my house, you're not going to have it. Okay? All right? But it's why the cup of deliverance is so essential. Because it allows us to heal from past hurts. It allows us to find freedom and it allows us to find the fullness of what God wants for us. It's really why relationships that we talk about in the cup of deliverance are so very important. It's why small groups are so important. Because you can get around a group of people that see you for who you are, 
now. Not who you used to be. You can build relationships with people that speak life into you. It says God has something more for you. That's why small groups and relationships are so very important. Ministry teams that you can join in. They're so very important because others will see what's inside of you. Not just your history. They don't have the internal monologue going on in their head that says, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. They just see how good you are now. And they say, listen, God's got something for you. His spirit's on you. There's something amazing that you can do. And here's the word I have for everybody. God has more for you. He has great things for you. We just have to come into that place where we allow him to have a fullness in our lives. Psalm chapter 18, verse 34, it says, you stoop down to make me great. You stoop down to make me great. He stoops down because he knows the greatness inside of you. He knows it because he put it inside of you. He, he, he sees greatness in you that you don't see in yourself. God wants to help you discover what you were made for. He wants to help you to experience the fulfillment that comes from living the life that he has called you to live, you need to, you need to dismiss the I'm not good enough, the inferiority complex. Get rid of it. The other thing that the devil will do, the other reason why people don't drink from the cup of redemption is because of diversion. Is diversion. Satan loves to use everyday problems to create diversions in our lives. He wants us to be spiritually nearsighted. He doesn't want us to see the big picture. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Tonight, we've got a worship night. And I promise you, 900 things are going to pop up between now and tonight that are going to try and distract you from coming. Some of them need your immediate attention. But listen, an hour spent in the presence of God is priceless. An hour, and as part of tonight, we're going to have a time where uh, during worship, the, the pastors will be available and our altar workers that will be here tonight will be available to pray for you in the midst of worship. Because we want to release the burdens. We want to release the hurts, the habits, the hang-ups, all of those things that hold us back. And so how many of you have just tried to get some, Friday was that day, right? Pastor Yvonne and Pastor Yvonne, she had, she had a list of things to do and I had a list of th things to do. Friday's our day off in case you're curious, but I had 9,000 texts. Uh, all I was trying to do at home on Friday was I, I needed to hang three sets of curtains. Three sets of curtains. It took me three and a half hours to hang three sets of curtains. Not because I'm slow. I'm so I'm not as fast as others, but I'm, I'm a lot faster than some. But it was, I had this text, I had this phone call, I had this. They were all valid things. But how many of you experienced that? Before long, you, I've got something I want to do, but i got somebody else has a plan for me. But this is what the devil wants to do. The devil wants to do as much as he can to distract you from what God wants to do. Because Jesus has a plan for your life. And many of us are spiritually nearsighted, so we don't think in long term. We just think about what's right in front of us. Here's the thing. The devil is not playing checkers with us. The devil's playing chess. Right, Wendell? He's playing chess. Now, you might not realize this, but every Monday night, we've got a chess small group. And if you've ever played somebody that's really good at chess, they're like five, six, seven, eight moves ahead of you. Right? We had a guy at my home church, Phil Del Turco. Uh, Phil was a great chess player. But there's no point in playing Phil because, like, you would make one move and he's like, all right, I got you beat. And you're like, why did I just? But that's how it worked. But a lot of us are playing checkers. The devil's not playing checkers. He's playing chess. He's thinking five and six steps ahead of you. Now, he doesn't know what's inside your head. Don't let anyone tell you the devil can read your thoughts because he cannot. The devil is a really observant individual, though. And he watches what you do. He studies you. He pays attention to those things that will distract you. He pays attention to those things that could be a stumbling block in your path. He looks at him and says, all right, you're, oh, you're doing good, you're doing good. Here, let's see how you do with that. You got to get ahead. 
You got to see, see further. Again, that's why small groups are so important. I don't want to harp on things. But listen, being in the midst of relationships helps you make better decisions. Helps you weather a storm. It helps you go through it. When I have difficulty, I got people I text. I got people I call. I say, all right, help me think through this one. Am I, am I thinking right on this? Because my first response is just squish it, right? Um, I can squash things with the best of them. But sometimes I need somebody to say, yeah, that, that's not right. That's not the response that you need to have. Be part of something. You say, Pastor Spencer, I don't really know anyone at church. Okay, come to Calvary 101 next Sunday. I'll introduce you to people, right? If, if, if you join a small group, you say, I'm not quite ready for a small group. I would encourage you to be in a small group. But, like, ladies, if you're not ready for a small group, uh, our women's ministry has a table out in the foyer. We've got a women's retreat coming up in February. It's with the district. It's a, it's a one-night one event. It's good. What a great way to get to know people. Do not live this life alone. Because when you live this life alone, it's the strength of one. Matt Losa was talking, talking to me about the, the strength of manpower, right? So if a job takes eight hours for one guy to do, if you have two guys, it's, it's not necessarily half the time. It might be, you know, 40% of the time because of multiplication. It's the same way in your life. Doing something by yourself means the only person you have to rely on is yourself. But doing something with two or three, it's like what the Bible says. We talked about it last week. A strand of three cords is not easily broken. You do not have to do this life alone. You do not have to do it alone. The devil wants you to keep you, keep you focused on the wrong things. You know what he wants to keep you focused on? He wants to keep you focused on yourself. That's our favorite top topic, right? The devil wants to keep us so focused on ourselves, on our own issues, and our own conveniences that we never see things around us. And if he can keep us looking at just at ourselves, he can keep you from being restored to the fullness of what God is calling you to. So here's the question, because the Apostle Paul had so many challenges in his ministry. How is it that the Apostle Paul faced every kind of problem, shipwrecked? imprisonment. He, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was not, he did not have an easy ministry. How did he face all these things? Yet he was never derailed from his calling. It's a simple word. It's the word focus. Focus is how he did it. And it's not just willpower, okay? We're not talking about I need to be more disciplined. That's not what we're talking about. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 17 and 18. It says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is, on, what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What is it that we're fixing our eyes on? Jesus. It's not in my own strength that I find this fullness. It is in the strength of Christ that I find it. And you can always spot spiritually nearsighted people because life is always about them. How are you is never returned. How are you is, okay, let me tell you everything that's going on. And not say, how are you? Spiritually nearsighted people, they never look past themselves. Do we pray just for our own needs or do we pray big prayers for the church? Do we pray big prayers for the world? Do we pray big prayers for those that are lost and need to come to Jesus or do we just see the wall in front of us and miss God's promises of salvation. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. It says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if anyone does not have them, he is nearsighted and blind and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from past sins. That's why you can't rush from the cup of deliverance to the cup of, of redemption. We all have problems, and yes, we should bring them to God, but if we never look beyond ourselves, we will only find ourselves stuck here. 
in the second cup. The cup of redemption is essential because it moves us past ourselves into caring and loving and reaching out for others. Satan would love for you to live on the treadmill of past sins. He would love for you to live on the treadmill of deliverance and self-absorption. Because if he can keep you focused on yourself, you're never going to tell anybody else about Jesus. If you only see your own problems, you're never going to bless somebody else with the gospel. That's why we have to move into a new place. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Each one should use whatever gifts he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. God has given you a gift. And I could we could preach, preach a whole message on this, but here's the things that we have to do. You have to discover your gift. You have to develop your gift, and then you have to use your gift. There's three aspects of the vision for Calvary that we've shared multiple times. We want you to encounter Jesus, right? That's the cup of salvation. We want you to experience transformation. That's the cup of deliverance. And then we want to express our faith. If you never move to that third cup where you've been redeemed, you never get to that place where you're expressing your faith now, this is the point in the sermon. Listen, I, I planned these sermons out in advance where I was going to make a big push and you need to get involved in ministry. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I do believe every single person in this building, in this room, should be involved in an area of ministry someplace. But without the right internal heart motivation, even serving in ministry can actually be a detriment to your growth. We sometimes get off track in serving. And we think that serving justifies us. Look, I'm working for God, so I'm doing good, right? But I know people that have been working for God hard, but they didn't know who Jesus was anymore because their identity had been come up in, wrapped up in working, not knowing. Drinking from the cup of redemption is essential, and it's the essence of discipleship. There's a, there's a book, I've referenced it before. Eventually, one of these days, I'm going to have to do a teaching on it. It's called The Critical Journey. And uh, they've got six steps of The Critical Journey um, that talks about our stages of faith. The first one is the recognition of God. The second one is the life of discipleship. The recognition of God is, is really salvation when we first get saved. The life of discipleship is when we start growing in our knowledge of God. The third one is the productive life. It's when we start working and serving and volunteering. It's wonderful time. I love serving. I love serving. But 80% of evangelical Christians get stuck in stage three. And there's six stages. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I want us to understand this. Stage three and stage five look almost identical on the outside. The difference between stage three and stage five is the internal motivation. In stage three, when we're still growing uh, as a new Christian, we are serving because it makes us feel good about ourselves. That's why so many Christians get stuck there, because we feel good about it. I want you to feel good about serving, but if we're serving for the pats on the backs, and those are saying, the attaboys, attaboy, good job, way to go. We're serving from the wrong place. That's the difference between stage three and stage five. Stage five is the life of love. When we are, des- or the journey outward, I'm sorry. It's when we are desiring to reflect Christ back to people around and we are serving from a love of God. It's not that any one of these stages is bad. The problem is when we get stuck in one. Here's what I want us to understand as we talk about the life of discipleship and we talk about uh, discipleship and the cup of redemption and the essence. Discipleship is not simply learning about the Bible. Oftentimes we talk about we need to be better at discipling people and so we talk about needing to develop better classes. Listen, learning from the Bible, learning about the Bible is essential and it should be a lifelong endeavor. It should be something that you want to do all your life. But learning about the Bible is not enough. You must be applying it to your life. Don't learn about love simply. You need to be more 
loving. Don't read amazing stories about people in the Bible that had great faith. Grow in your faith. Don't just read about these things. Apply them to yourself. How are you living it out? And as I was preparing this, um, I came up with a, a, an example that I think is going to step on a few toes. And that's okay, because have you ever had somebody step on your toes when you're sitting down? What's it do? You immediately sit up, right? You know, just, ow! Our community has a unique demographic and makeup. And one of the challenges that I've heard, I've been, I've been here for three years. One of the most common complaints I have, I've heard, they're supposed to be God's chosen people. How can they behave like this? Talking about the Orthodox. They're supposed to be God's chosen people. What are they known for most? Studying the Torah, right? We got synagogues all over the place. We got the, the biggest yeshiva outside of Israel here in the, in, in the country, here. We, we, thousands of Orthodox are studying here. And the most common complaint that I hear is, how can they do this? They're supposed to be God's chosen people. Don't they know what the word of God says? But I got to tell you, we got a bunch of Orthodox Christians that all they do is read the Bible and not live it. Do we love more? Do people, the, the Bible tells us that people will know you by your love for one another. Could they identify you as a Christian by how you love other people? The way you serve other people? Or just the words that come out of your mouth? Words aren't enough. Because if we don't live what the word of God says, we're not really living a redeemed life. We're still living as a slave. Listen, there are, there are people that I'm sure in here, they have more, some more scripture verses memorized than I do. And I'm not putting my life up as an example to say, hey, I've got it all figured out. But memorizing the word of God is not sufficient. Studying the word of God is not sufficient. You study but do you apply it? Do you live it? Are you more loving? Are you more faithful? Are you more generous? Are you selfless? The fruits of the Spirit, love, patience, peace, kindness, do they manifest in your life? Or are they just words on a page? 1 Peter 2.9 has a wonderful reminder for us. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The goal of life isn't just to learn. Learning is important in lifelong, like I said. It's to apply. We are not meant to just study the Bible. We are meant to live it. We don't want to just read about love. We want to show love to those that are unlovable. Not just to those that are kind to us. Anybody, the Bible even says anybody can be kind to somebody that's kind to them. Love your enemies. That's hard. Love those that you disagree with. That's hard. Don't just read about it. It's the story of the Good Samaritan, right? You're familiar with this? I need to wrap up here. The story of the Good Samaritan is so clear. The teachers of the law saw this, this individual that had been beaten, was sick, dying, and they knew the law. All of these people knew the law, and they walked right by him. Why? Because they didn't live the word. If you walk by the guy on the ground, are we living the word of God? The cup of redemption, it restores us to the calling that God has for us. 
He has created you for a purpose. He has created you for a reason. He has created you to fulfill his call in this world. My purpose, your purpose, our purpose is to serve God by serving others. You have a gift. Join a ministry team. Go on a missions trip. Bless others. You saw in the bulletin, there's a a thing in there, the, the flyers, generous living, blessed to be a blessing. Over the next three Sundays, starting next Sunday, we're going to be collecting toiletries. And I, it, I, it, might say, it might say travel size for stuff. We're not doing travel size. Do full size. Okay. Um, and you see out in the foyer, there's, there's bins, and we'll have them labeled for next Sunday. But we're going to start blessing community groups in, this, in, in the area. We're going to partner with Code Blue that does the homeless shelters when it's cold. We're going to We're going to help American Keswick with uh, their drug recovery programs. We're going to help the pregnancy center uh, by providing supplies. We're going to help foster families in the community. God has blessed us so that we can bless others. This is part of drinking from the cup of redemption. My purpose, my purpose is to serve God by serving others. And if we want to fulfill that purpose... We have to be willing to live the Bible out every day. Don't just study it. I want you to go to a small group. But a part of our small groups this summer, we're going to have a serve day where we work together and apply what we've been learning. Why? Because we are Jesus' hands extended. And you might not be able to serve every week. You might not be able to serve every place. There might be some unique places that you can reach that we can't. But you have a gift. And God has called you to fulfill it. As part of this series, since these four cups come from that Seder meal that the Jewish faith practice, salvation, deliverance, redemption, that first Seder, the, the, the Lord's Supper, that Seder meal where we receive communion from, we're incorporating communion into each week of this message as a reminder that these are promises God gave us. Because he said it's a new covenant in his blood. It's just a reminder that we are called to more. We are called to more. There is a higher expectation on you because you have called Jesus your Savior. It's not bad to have more expectation put on you because you don't have to do it by yourself. Jesus is with you. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Don't get distracted. Allow him to strengthen you and encourage you because there's more for you. He has a purpose for you. He has a purpose for